very warm welcome to this our online service at St Mary's Wotton. It's great to have you with us. My name is Philip Young and I'm the curate here. Well I hope you've been able to recover from the days of mourning following the devastating English loss in the Euro final on Sunday night. Or conversely, if you're one of the many Italian supporters here in Bedford, uh, you've probably had a week of jubilation. At the moment, we are in a series in a prophecy from the Old Testament called Malachi. And this week, our Associate Minister Sean Atkins will be preaching from the start of chapter 2, where there are some very stern words for the spiritual leadership of God's people. It's written in Psalm 95, verse 6. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. The great privilege we have is to worship the one who made the heavens and the earth and who pitched a tent for the sun in the heavens. So let me lead us in prayer as we come before our maker this morning. O Lord, our creator and redeemer, as you have given us this day for worship, so now we bring to you the service of our hearts and hands and voices. Accept our prayers and praises. Speak to us through your living word, the Bible. Deepen our fellowship with one another. And may we leave this service with joy in our hearts. Through your King Jesus we ask. Amen. Our God created the heavens and the earth. Please lift up your voices to sing the words of our opening hymn, How Great Thou Art.
The Lord is our Maker. He is also our Saviour or Rescuer, the one who can get us back on track when we fall so far short of His will for our lives. So let us confess our sins to Him in penitence and faith in the words that will appear on the screen. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things that we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us sinners. Spare those who confess their faults restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, a most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a disciplined, righteous and godly life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
written in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 King Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever so let us declare our faith in this unchanging King and Savior in the words of the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to use some of the words of Psalm 95 to lead us into our prayers this morning. For the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and in the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the God, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the amazing privilege of knowing you personally as a great God who holds the whole world in his hand. We thank you that we are part of the church family here at St Mary's. We thank for you for those you have raised up into leadership roles within the local church. Today we are particularly thankful for the church wardens for the wide range of responsibilities they have at St Mary's. Always a complex role but especially we acknowledge the increase in their work in a flu pandemic with so many rules and restrictions. Thank you for Hazel and for Ant for the wisdom and skill and commitment they bring to this role. We bring the PCC to you as it meets in person tomorrow for the first time in so many months. May they make wise decisions. We think especially of the issues relating to COVID and to finance. 
that we would make good, good decisions about these while still focusing on the central mission of the church. As the church considers outreach over the coming months, guide and direct those as they think of innovative ways to share our faith in the village of Wootton. We recognise also the ongoing COVID issues both in our country and around the world. In the UK, we think of COVID in light of the growing infection rate. May those in government and leadership make wise decisions around raising restrictions. We especially remember those who feel particularly vulnerable with these changes. We think too of those in education as the school year comes to a close. In a year with constant challenges and changes in education and with COVID too. May the teachers and support staff enjoy a time of rest and relaxation before the beginning of the new academic year. We acknowledge the differences in our lives and the people close to us and in this quiet space we bring those to you who are in our hearts. May we lift them to your care. We finish our time of prayer together as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen.
Today's reading is from Malachi 2, verses 1 to 9. And now, you priests, this is a warning for you. If you do not listen and if you do not resolve to honour my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not resolved to honour me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth. But you have turned away, and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all of the people, because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in the matters of law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the third in our series of sermons on the book of the prophet Malachi. Just to recap, Malachi was preaching in the middle of the 5th century BC, a time of serious spiritual and moral decline in ancient Israel. God had shown his love for the Israelites by choosing them out of all peoples to be his own. But their election as God's people carried obligations and responsibilities as well as privileges, and they were failing, failing badly to live up to them. In fact, the whole book of Malachi is a series of divine complaints. They questioned God's love for them instead of trusting in it. They showed contempt for God by offering defiled and unacceptable sacrifices. They broke covenant with God by marital unfaithfulness and divorce. They wearied God with their adultery, falsehood, fraud and injustice. They robbed God by holding back their tithes and gifts. And they spoke against God in arrogant cynicism. Chapter 1 verses 6 to 14 was about dishonouring God by bringing unacceptable, contemptible sacrifices, offering to God what was worthless to them. And it began with a, a question about God's honour. A son honours his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honour due to me? If I am a master, where is the respect due to me? says the Lord Almighty. That passage today picks up the theme of honour due to God. It warns the priests that God will punish them if they do not resolve to honour his name. But though it's addressed to the priests, it has implications for all of God's people. The priests were to set an example of honouring God, but obviously the people were meant to follow that example. Now this passage has three sections. Verses 2 to 4 tell us what the Lord will do. Verses 5 to 7 tell us what they should have done and verses 8 to 9 what they had actually done. So first what God will do. Verse 2, I will send a curse on you and I will curse your blessings. Verse 3, I will rebuke, literally cut off, your descendants. That was serious because the priesthood was hereditary. What God is saying is that the priestly line will die out. Again, verse 3, I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices and you'll be carried off with it. When they brought burnt offerings, the flesh and the fat were to be burned on the altar. The dung... And the offal was to be carried outside the city and burned on a dung heap. God is effectively saying that, that you'll be carried off 
just as the dung and the offal is carried off from the sacrifices. Now, this is pretty terrible, but it is conditional, verse 2, if you do not listen and if you do not resolve to honour me. So there is the possibility of repentance and change. And verse 4, this is meant to be restorative. You will know that I've sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, so that the priesthood may continue and not die out. My covenant with Levi refers to God's choice of the Levites out of all the tribes of Israel to be God's priests. So that is what God will do. He'll punish them. Well, what the priests should have done is spelt out in verses 5 to 7. Verse 5, this, this covenant called for reverence, but the priests have not reverenced God. They've not honoured his name. Verse 6, true instruction was in his mouth and nothing false was found on his lips. This is talking about the ideal priest. He's a true teacher of God's word, of God's law, and there's no nothing false in his teaching. Comes again in verse 7, the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty and people seek instruction from his mouth. Notice that this talks about the priest's role of teaching. We usually think of the priests as offering sacrifices and interceding in prayer for God's people, but they also had a responsibility to teach the law of God to the people of God. And then thirdly, um, verse 6 again, He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. He was not only to teach the law, but the priest was to walk in it himself, to set an example of obeying God's law. That's what they should have been doing. But verses 8 and 9 spell out what they had in fact done. Verse 8, but you have turned from the way. That comes again at the end of verse 9. You have not followed my ways. Again, verse 8, by your teaching, you've caused many to stumble. Their teaching of the law had not been faithful or accurate and had caused people to be led away. You may recall that Jesus said something serious about causing little ones to stumble. If we do that, he says, it would be better to have a millstone tied around our necks and to be thrown into the depths of the sea. Uh, then right at the end of verse 9, it says, you've shown partiality in matters of the law, as well as teaching the law. If um, situations arose where it wasn't clear what should be done in the light of God's law, or there was a dispute between two people, uh, the people would come to the priest to ask for guidance and instruction. How does the law apply to this situation? What should I do in this situation? What does the word of God say? They were showing partiality in matters of the law. That could mean that they were picking and choosing between different commandments and instructions of the law, or it could mean that they were favouring some people over others. Um, being unfair in effect. Well, that is what they were doing. Far from teaching God's word faithfully and walking in it themselves, they were actually leading people astray. What we have here is a solemn responsibility for priests to teach God's word truthfully and accurately, to instruct God's people in it faithfully, to apply it accurately in real life and to follow it obediently themselves in daily conduct. Now, when we turn to the New Testament and to the Church of Christ, it is exactly the same. For example, in the letters of Timothy and Titus, the qualifications for ministers in the church are godly life, on the one hand, 
and the ability to teach the truth and to correct error on the other. Godly living and faithful teaching of the word of God. There's a delightful scene in uh, Huckleberry Finn where uh, a girl called Mary Ellen is asking Huckleberry Finn about his uncle's church. And Huckleberry Finn is boasting that in his uncle's church there, there are, I think, 16 deacons. Mary Ellen is very impressed and rather surprised. She says, well, well what do they do? What are they for? And Huckleberry Finn replies, well... They're not really for anything. They don't do anything very much. They loll around and pass the plate and one thing another, but mostly, he says, they don't do nothing. They're not for anything. They're just for style. Well, in the New Testament, ministers are not just for style or lolling around or passing the plate. They're primarily preachers and teachers of the word of God. Not primarily really organisers or administrators or, or even in a sense leaders, but primarily preachers and teachers of God's word. It's the same actually in the ordination service in the Church of England in the Book of Common Prayer. Those who are to be ordained priest are addressed with these words. You cannot by any other means compass the doing of so weighty a work that pertains to the salvation of man but with doctrine and exhortation taken out of the holy scriptures and with a life agreeable to the same teaching the scriptures and leading a life that is agreeable to the same scriptures that's the job of a minister in the church. Now it follows from this that there is a corresponding responsibility on the part of all God's people to be taught, to hear, read, study, learn and obey the word of God. In fact the word that's uh, translated disciple in our Bibles really means pupil. To be a disciple is to be a pupil, a learner of God's word. Many books have been written about preaching sermons. I can't think of any off the top of my head that have been written about listening. But in scripture, actually, it's the other way around. There's not much about how to preach and teach, except to be faithful to scripture and to be clear in explaining it. There's an awful lot about listening to God's word, about understanding it, learning it and doing it. When he appointed me to be priest in charge of a church in London, the late Bishop John Hughes said this to me. So when you're preaching, the congregation thinks that you are performing and they are the audience passing judgment on your performance. He said, in fact, that is not the case. You are merely the prompt. The congregation is putting on the performance and the audience criticising the performance is God. So there is a responsibility to learn, to be taught the word of God. But also there is a responsibility for all God's people to teach one another. In Deuteronomy it comes over and over and over again that it's not just the responsibility of the priest to teach the people. It is the responsibility of all the people to teach their own children God's law and his ways. And that hasn't changed in the New Testament. And in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, there's a reference to all Christians teaching and admonishing one another. 
So while there is a primary responsibility for ministers to teach, there is actually a responsibility for all of us to teach and instruct one another in God's ways. So in conclusion, what does it mean to honour God? What must we do to give God the honour that is due to his name? It's important to realise that God's name will be honoured in all the earth. See Malachi chapter 1 verses 5, 11 and 14. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray for this. Hallowed be thy name in earth as it is in heaven. And one day, the New Testament assures us, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow to the glory of God the Father. The question is whether we will be part of this. Will we honour God? Will we be part of that worldwide honouring of his name? To honour God, we must honour the word of God. We must study and learn God's words together. We must teach God's word to one another. We must walk daily in the way of God's word and encourage each other to do the same. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have said that you will honour those who honour you and you have caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so read, mark, learn and inwardly digest your word, that both our teaching and our living may be conformed to it, and that we may walk faithfully and obediently in your ways, to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.
As many of you know, tomorrow, the 19th of July, it is expected that many restrictions will begin to be relaxed across the country, uh, including the re legal requirement to wear masks, socially distance, and the prohibition against singing in services. Our PCC will meet tomorrow night to decide what implications this relaxation has for us here at St Mary's and we'll communicate that to you all shortly thereafter uh, to help us know what things are going to be like over the weeks and months ahead. At 11.30 today as usual we have Zoom coffee. Please do come catch up with other members of the church family, listen out to how we can support and pray for one another there. Links, uh, link is on the bulletin and on the website. Finally, tonight we meet to pray. It is written in Psalm 127, Unless the Lord builds the house, the labourers build in vain. Please come and join in prayer to our Heavenly Father for all that lies ahead for us as a church family at this time of transition. A blessing as we close. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through King Jesus our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.